Hello, my friend, and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 277. Have you ever looked for a marriage record and not found it where you thought it should be? In those cases, you might just need to look somewhere else besides where the bride and the groom lived. In Genealogy Gems podcast episode 274, you might remember that professional genealogist J. Mark Lowe was here to explain the concept of a Gretna Green. And in this episode, he's back with a genealogy case study that demonstrates how the concept of a Gretna Green can actually help you solve marriage mysteries. And of course, there are more than just brides and grooms listed on marriage records. A lot of times you're going to find the names of witnesses. Now, these usually aren't just some random guy off the street. A lot of times a witness was a relative. And even if they weren't, they can sometimes give us even greater insight into who our ancestors were by figuring out the relationship between the witness and our ancestor. Well, genealogist Robin Smith is also here, and she's going to share her three-step research process for witnesses from her Family Tree Magazine article called Witness Testimony. So let's get going. We're going to start off with Mark Lowe's fascinating marriage record case study. Well, we can, I'll kind of show you my mistakes from the beginning then as we look at this. That's my grandparents, and that's Papa Lowe and Mama Lowe. That's what we called them. So they were very, very sweet couple, and and, uh, and so it's, it's always fun to know who you're looking for. My dad knew a lot about his parents, and he, he was the oldest child. But do you know what? He did not know. He, he thought they just got married in Bowling Green, where they lived. He just said they got married in Bowling Green. And the, there I was with the county court clerk. Well, there wasn't a marriage for my grandparents. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'll have to tell you, my grandmother was... The term we use is called teetotaler, so you know what that means. So mm-hmm. that typically she was not an alcohol user, but she was somewhat rigid and strict in some ways. And so the thought of me even thinking about my my thought was, I think I said to the clerk, "Were my grandparents actually married?" <laughs> and he just burst out in big laughter. By the way, he just he knew them. So he just thought it was hilarious that a seven-year-old, because that's when, (laughs) that I actually, in in the fact that he said, he called her Miss Eunice. He called my grandmother Miss Eunice. And he just said, he just laughed. And he said, no, son, I'm sure that they went somewhere else to get married. It was very popular at the time. He didn't tell me where they were married, though. So it was some years after that before I found that. I did know that from the 1920 census that they were already married. So this is, that's, that's my great grandparents household. And my grandfather is Ernest, my grandmother is Eunice. So by the 20 census, they are married. And I knew that that it had to be close at that time period because I knew it was after my grandfather was back from World War One. This helps that they're at least somewhere close that they're a married couple living with his parents. So they, they didn't go, you know, they didn't go to California, for example, or Texas. They didn't go too far. If they did, they're back. And, and so it was yeah. kind of like doing what we normally do, which I think as a beginner, we're taught to look, start in the county where they're living. And so this is South Central Kentucky, the map that you see from the time period. It's a 1924 map that I found on davidrumsey.com and so you kind of see the blue star is is generally where they lived kind of in the northeast corner of warren county kentucky uh, bowling green's the county seat and so i looked there but i learned as a young researcher that if they're not if you're not in the first place then you look in at the surrounding place you look at every place that touches that well there's a lot of counties (laughs) that touch warren (laughs) And I, I checked every one of those counties. Now, it took me a while to do it. I couldn't do it at seven. I had to wait till I could drive. So it took several years for me to be able, I wrote a few letters, but I didn't find that for several years. You also see along that, where that blue star is, there's, that's a railroad, by the way, and not a driving road. And so the other thing that I thought about 
is the railroad. So I also went to counties beyond the adjacent counties because of the railroad. So I really did. I, I, I went all the way even up to Louisville, which is just north, probably about two hours by train north of that. I even, even checked those counties. I didn't find them. And uh, you, you probably could see the obvious. The great thing is that I looked at this map more carefully and had what, if I had known what I know today to begin to think about the Gretna Greens, I would have at least looked at the differences between, I showed you those differences in Kentucky law and Tennessee law. I might would have looked at that, and I probably would have looked at the statistics for the counties along the Tennessee-Kentucky border where there were more marriages. Had I done that, which is what I showed you, if I had done that, if I'd followed my own advice, uh, I would probably have seen. It's a, on the map, if, you, if you'll follow that railroad kind of down and then it goes straight south and there's a Simpson County and it goes down to Franklin and then that's where we call the triangular jog. That's, that's a little break in the line up between Kentucky and Tennessee. It's a historical point. Well, just south, just south of that is a little town called Mitchellville. It's in Sumner County. It's just over the state line, and there's a railroad stop there. Well, guess what? That's where they got married. Oh, well. Hopped on a train, went to Mitchellville, got off the train, went to the JP, and they were able to do everything. And then probably hopped on the train, next train going north, and went back home. So, you know, I do want to verify that. So, yes, it's there. There's a marriage bond for them. Uh, they married. And what's interesting here is we always look at the bondsman because usually that's to help us to connect with other family and associates and people that they know. But what's interesting about this is that the, the bondsman is F.M. Groves. That's also the Justice of the Peace who married them. And notice at the top it says that F.M. Groves paid <laughs> for the bond. I did with the Gretna Green. You know what he was known as? The Marrying Squire. <laughs> I love that. Because, <laughs> because if you crossed over to Mitchellville, he was the JP. He had an office near the train station. And I guess that probably was almost his full-time job. Well, he says people would come there to get married. And everybody knew about it. And so they would come and get married. He would take care of the license. They would go on their way, take care of the money and everything. And then he would record, he would take all of those marriages to the county court clerk's office over in Gallatin in Sumner County and record those. I never thought about that having looked, you know, look for those later. When, when I looked, they actually are in the marriage register. But that's not where they were. It wasn't done the day they were married because right. he did everything in his office and then he took all the stuff to the marriage record. So in the indexes, they copied my grandmother's, her name was Eunice, and on his record, you can clearly say it says Eunice Martin in that bond that I just showed you. Well, it's a little scratchy, but when it's indexed on the other record, they, they missed the U and they indexed her as Ennis, E-N-N-I-C-E. And so that's the other thing in a Gretna Green, when you're checking an index, if it was copied by a JP and then taken to the clerk, it's mm -hmm. possible, again, there could be errors in the name transfer or the copying, or if, the, if the, the clerk was trying to read the JP's handwriting and it was really bad, then the name could be totally obliterated in the register, which is usually what's used to index. So... That can also create a problem in finding them too, uh, but in but that there. But the fact that I now know that they were married by this marrying squire, uh, and I found the article about him, and he was involved with the railroad. So he was smart, a smart man mm -hmm. that realized that there were a lot of folks in the time period post World War One uh, interested in getting married and and. Uh, he was in favor of that, and so that a lot of folks did it. And what's 
interesting is almost all of my my grandfather's siblings married at, he's the oldest married kind of they all the ones that married about the same time a few years after them they all came to Mitchellville they all came to the same place and then all their cousins that married in that next decade um, from the 20s on almost all of them did the same thing they hopped the train and they came down to Sumner County Mitchellville and got married it became almost like that was the the heritage place and why I wouldn't have known that <laughs> if what then once I know it then it's like I didn't even have to go to, to to Kentucky to look up any more records they're all right here in Sumner County they're right here so uh, again the Gretna Green creates a whole new situation of of helping us once you begin to see it you see the pattern and yeah you know what one of the things that we have today that we didn't have back when I was seven is we didn't have <laughs> access to great records that have been indexed to us on Family Search, Ancestry, My Heritage, all these great resources that I could have looked for that marriage. But I might not have looked on Tennessee because I thought with it, I would have thought they got married in Kentucky. So again, you do need to think about possibility, you know, of where you live. What are the places that people would typically go? That newspaper summary would help and those other marriages marriage records would help and we have great indices but if you can't find them clearly go back to that concept of looking because a lot of times a records not it's not where we think it will be or maybe it's not there uh, and I was looking for one today I know Lisa you'll know you know who Pat Boone is the the singer yeah. right you know yeah. Pat okay all my life I've known that Pat Boone and his wife is <laughs> Shirley Foley um, right. They were a young couple. They married in 50, 1953. And I'd always known that Pat Boone got married in this town, in Springfield. It it was kind of a, kind of known as a Gretna Green because of the rural area. So people didn't want to get married in Nashville. They often came up here. But I actually looked in the newspaper, and it actually said that Pat, Pat and Shirley their newspaper account in Nashville indicated that they had married uh, in Springfield. And it actually indicated the church, that they actually were married in the study of a church here. And it talked about who the witnesses were, because one of them was one of his college professors in Nashville. And so I just wanted to find that. And I thought, well, since they married here, they also got their license here. And so again, that's not the case. They actually got their marriage license in Nashville. I'm sorry, in, in an adjacent county, in Davidson County. And then they came up here and and had it solemnized. So again, um, if I was looking for the record, I, even though they married here, I thought, you know, I looked for the record here. The record's not here. The record is in Nashville. And so sometimes... That's not really uh, the same thing as they went somewhere to get married, in this case, the Gretna Green, and the records are there. But again, you have to stop and think about, what am I looking for, and what's the truth of the situation? You know, listen to the story, and the story will help you find the details often. That's a great point. And I think you're right. A lot of people assume that it always happens all in one place, but maybe not. And how amazing that the Marion Squire said, 12,000 marriages. That's a lot of people. We'll have more of Mark's case study right after this. Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full service experience that bridges your past, present, and future. The MyHeritage DNA kit reveals your ethnic origins and finds your new relatives based on shared DNA. It's popular all over the world, and their constantly growing DNA database means that more matches to new relatives are just around the corner. You'll receive a percentage breakdown of your ethnic origins from 42 supported regions and weekly email updates as new DNA matches are found. It's also the leading DNA service for anyone with European origins. Make the most of your DNA results with a MyHeritage subscription and access advanced tools for genetic genealogy, like the theory of family relativity, autoclusters, shared ancestral places, and much more. 
Order your kit today at myheritage.com slash DNA. Already taken a DNA test with another service? Upload your DNA data to MyHeritage for free to receive DNA matches and access new discoveries. That's myheritage.com slash DNA. You know, these strategies are so terrific because, as you said, even though we can search uh, the index today, gosh, if it got transferred a couple times, the chances of not finding it in the index because the name got kind of chopped up as it kept getting transcribed, you'd have to go back to these strategies. And often people had nicknames. You know me as Mark, but my first name is John. So if I actually on a record was John Lowe, you might not have connected that with me. And I know that's often the case when I've been looking for brides and I know them as Elizabeth. There's not an Elizabeth in that mar- in a marriage record. And I may have known she married somebody named Williams. So I'm looking for an Elizabeth marrying a Williams. And even if I know her last name and I know of a particular case where the young lady's name was Caroline Elizabeth. She went by Elizabeth, but her first name was Caroline, but she never used it. Guess what? She used it on a marriage record. <laughs> so that's often a, a name and, and, it could have been misheard. I've known an, I know another person who went by, I think she went by Martha. Her name was not Martha. Her name was Mary Ann. And she got a nickname of Martha because she had an Aunt Martha. And so they called her Little Martha and it, was, it became a nickname. And so she went by that. She went by Martha. Her legal name was Mary Ann. Hmm. And so... It, that was another one, and they went away. And, and often, too, my my grandfather ended up working for the railroad later. And I would say that when the railroad passes through an area, and I found this to be true in a lot of cases, if if the with the transportation situation with the railroad, how it was inexpensive, that often that would have led to even more chances of the Gretna Green happening. Because... Right. I know of, of several couples along the railroad who decided to go somewhere else. For example, in Kentucky, to get out of Kentucky and go marry, they could hop on a train and within about two hours, they could be up in Illinois, in White County, Illinois. So I know a couple in Southern Kentucky who they plant, they lived in different towns. They shared notes about how they were going to run off and get married and all this. And they're in the notes, but we don't always have those notes afterwards, right? right. Grandma, didn't, Grandma didn't leave me all the personal <laughs> things that she wrote to Grandpa. Those I don't have. And so in that case, this family ends up having these later. And they planned this whole thing. They hopped on the train, had a bag, and they went across the state line to White County, Illinois and got married. And that, you would think, wow, I would never look that far away. All you've got to do is just follow that map of where the train goes. And a lot of folks in eastern Kentucky recently, I talked about this and I helped some folks. And in every case, using the railroad map, Lisa, we were able to pinpoint, I said, from here to there, the most logical place for them to go to get married would be here, here, or here. But uh, almost in every case, they either went to Lexington or Louisville because big city, they had, had a JP probably that they could hear the railroad guy knew who to go see to get that done quickly. And, and so they had a great experience and they were able to get back on the train and go back home and tell, Hey, we got married. And so that's one of the advantages, yeah. I guess, one of the advantages of the Gretna Green, it can be quick. And you can get mm-hmm. back home and announce it. I'm pretty sure that's part of what my grandparents did. They went and they came back and probably their friends knew and they probably had a reception or a party either then or the next day. So, Right, right. You, you know, and celebrate it could be, somehow. Exactly. And it might be that people couldn't necessarily afford a big wedding or um, it was just, you know, like a, a little getaway mini hun- honeymoon or they had to get back to work on Monday. Who knew? <laughs> Well, I think sometimes that's the most logical reason. It's probably very simple like that. And there are some cases where we know that perhaps one of the, let's say the father of the bride was not was not real thrilled about 
about his potential son-in-law. Okay, he he just didn't think she was good. He was good enough for her, for his daughter, and so he he probably pushed back. And although they were in love and they were working, you know, I think that happened a lot. And I know in cases where that that ultimately that if if they if they waited around then they ended up getting married but in many cases they were like well i just don't want to wait and and if 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 all it took was crossing two county lines right to get married and then they so you know i can hear her saying you know daddy will be okay with it once we're married it'll and once we're married <laughs> he'll be okay it'll all be fine um i think the justification of young minds uh, oh, yeah. often will lead us to make those decisions. It sounds like you know my grandmother. <laughs> because <laughs> um, I, I'm sure Daddy wasn't thrilled. And it was funny because they lived in Northern California, but they went to Carson City, Nevada to get married. And it was this little tiny thing in the paper, <sighs> nothing fancy. And the um, her fiancé, my grandfather, worked for the railroad. So it was super easy. They picked a spot. And I'm sure... She felt like, well, we'll come back and then we'll ask forgiveness later. <laughs> and uh, that's that kind of explains that whole situation. You know, uh, this has yeah. been terrific. And before I let you go, I really want to touch on one thing. Uh, I've been kind of trying to remind people lately about research plans. And when it's not a quick search and it doesn't just pop up on an ancestry or my heritage, you know, collection, but we're going to have to dig a little bit and do all this kind of background work. Look, you're talking about, you were talking about um, getting the map out and then marking the spots. Well, I envision all those locations go into that research plan so you can start creating a map of how you're going to approach it. If you had to give our, our viewers a pitch on why it's worth taking the time to take a deep breath and put a plan together, what would you say to them? <laughs> you know, that's easy because all of us have lost something important to us in our normal life. Now, as as we get older, we lose a lot more. I have to <laughs> yeah. I put things away. My glasses. But... <laughs> but the, it, when the research is so important with you, a plan becomes essential because not only does it help you follow, you think through it, and then you follow the steps as you, as you see them developing. It also helps you when you, when you follow those steps and you don't find the answer. A good plan helps you, and so does the GPS. It'll, it'll say recalculating, recalculating. If you have a written plan, if you've got a plan in place, when you get to that point, it's easy to just take a step back and look again. Uh, you know, I call that, that's my mull and ponder stage. You know, that's, that's, I love to just sit and, and relax and rock and think through what's my next option. And, and I think a plan will help you. Here's what I'm going to do next. But I often, in my, in my years of experience, I'll say, if it's not there, then I'm going to look here or I'm going to do this. I'm going to look for some alternates and I'm going ahead and thinking about it while I've got time. And so that's that's the real I think that's the real strength of a plan. I cannot imagine finding some of the great things that uh, great information that I found without a plan. They don't fall and hit you on the head. Usually <laughs> you usually have to go and, you know, you don't find you do not find new information by following the same old path. And mm -hmm. a plan helps you get to some new information. That's a great point and a great note to end on. Um, my friend, <laughs> this has been so much fun mulling and pondering marriages with you today. Thank you so much Thank for you. sharing your expertise. Tell people where they can find you and kind of what your specialty is in genealogy. Well, I love the South. I love original records in the Mill South. I'm easy to find. Uh, and I'm part of the KYTN, KYTN Research Associates. So they're easy to find us there. But uh, if you just look for anything related to the South, we all smile big and we're all looking for more information. So it's always good to hear about all these people doing great things. And, and Lisa, if they found you, 
then they'll know that, that somebody like me is nearby because it's always great to hear from great folks like you. And I learn, I learn when I'm always with you. We always have a good time. So thank you. I do. Thank you, my friend. The sponsor of today's episode of Genealogy Gems is newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive. Newspapers.com is your ultimate resource for discovering your family's history. You can explore more than 800 million newspaper pages in their vast collection spanning three centuries. Newspapers.com is your gateway to exploring the past with papers from the U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia, and beyond. Trace your family's journey and uncover the extraordinary tales of your ancestors through newspaper stories, birth and marriage announcements, obituaries, photos, and much more. For listeners of today's show, newspapers.com is extending a discount of 20% off on a Publisher Extra subscription. That's the one that I have. Just use the code Genealogy Gems all together, Genealogy Gems at checkout. Don't miss out this incredible opportunity at newspapers.com. Are you in search of a free facility to help you take your family history research to the next level? Well, consider planning a trip to one of my favorite places, the Genealogy Center at Allen County Public Library. It's located in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and the Genealogy Center is the second largest center in the nation for genealogy and one of the best places to research family histories due to its really extensive collection and services. The Genealogy Center has more than 1 million physical items, and they've got trained genealogists who work there who all have unique specialties, and they're available to help you find success for free. Use the services and materials at the Genealogy Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana to take your family history research to that next level. Plan your trip or book an appointment at Visit Fort Wayne dot com slash genealogy. That's visit fortwayne.com slash genealogy. We may not have been around when our ancestors lived, but there were witnesses to the important events in their life. And in her new article for Family Train Magazine called Witness Testimony, author and genealogist Robin Smith explains how witnesses can help you in your genealogy research. And I'm very happy to say she's here now to tell us more about it. Welcome to the show, Robin. Hi, such a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm so happy to have you Thank here. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, yes. of course, we were just chatting. I think we met years ago at a, at a conference and you have certainly been continuing to be busy in the genealogy world. Uh, you're blogging on reclaiming kin, is that right? Yes, yes. That's been my passion project for more than a decade now. And so that's where I share all the tips and all the things about skill building that I've learned. So the focus is skill building, but also I focus on the special challenges of researching the enslaved as well. And since Zoom, I actually also offer webinars through Reclaim the Kin as well. So it's just been a wonderful, it continues to grow and my audience continues to grow and it's just a pleasure. I know it's, it's a wonderful community, the genealogy community, and uh, all of us continue to grow. I learned a lot from your article in Family Tree Magazine, and I wanted to chat with you a little bit about that because I think researching witnesses is fascinating and it's something that maybe people don't always think about you know we focus on the names we recognize and not so much on the ones that we don't i'd love to have you kind of give your your elevator speech if you will is why should people be taking the time to research witnesses Okay. So most of us in the genealogy community, eventually we hear about this thing called cluster research. And we, we hear this phrase, the fan club, 
that genealogist Elizabeth Shawn Mills conceived, this friends, associates, and neighbors. And I would consider witnesses and bondsmen in that fan club, in that cluster. And simply put, they can just help us find more family. Uh, that's the benefit of researching the people, these individuals and the records in which, which they find them. We can break through some brick walls and it can also tell us about the community ties and some of the customs in that time and place. So witnesses and bondsmen are always my secret, secret research strategy. And I hope will be yours too. Now you mentioned bondsmen and that might be a new term for folks. You know, we might be used to seeing perhaps uh, an immigration record or a birth record and we see witness, but bondsmen, explain to us what that is. Okay, so this is one of those terms in genealogy that has a slightly different meaning historically than it does today. And so by bondsman, we just mean someone who pledges a sum of money as a bond for another. And sometimes in these records, we might uh, see that they're called a surety. You might see that term used. And so you can see the difference between that and a witness is that there's a financial obligation involved. And so you can imagine, I always try to tell people, it's similar to co-signing a loan today. And most of us would probably not co-sign a loan for people that we didn't trust or that we didn't know very well. And so if you can keep that concept in your mind, that's the value and the benefit of researching those witnesses and bondsmen. Oh, absolutely. I mean, gosh, when there's a financial tie, <laughs> there's some kind of relationship there. And I guess if we can <laughs> research them, that might lead us back even to more records of our own ancestor. So absolutely. what kind of records are we going to find witnesses and even more specifically this term bondsman? What kind of records are we looking for? Yes. So the big ones we think of, of course, marriage bonds. We hear that phrase a lot. So marriage records, almost all deeds are going to have some sort of witness involved, wills. And there are also the other records of probate. So executors and administrators often have to have bonds. If you're going to serve as guardian to someone, typically that person has to have a bond as well. And so those are sort of the big ones. We can also think of court cases, civil court cases, when you're trying to secure someone's appearance uh, at, a, at a future court meeting. And I actually have seen the courts go after that bondsman if that person doesn't show up. So some of these records can get pretty juicy. And of course, I think a lot of us are probably familiar with pension, military pension records and Southern claims. So I would consider those witnesses who are gonna provide their testimony. They might not be there in person, but you're going to have a body of people involved in those records as well. The only thing that I would caution people to watch out for is sometimes it really is just the county clerk or a local lawyer or local justice of the peace. So it's in researching that witness or that bondsman that you'll find out the relationship, if there is any, to the person of interest that you're researching. That's a really good point. <laughs> good, good kind of warning up front. I'm, I'm wondering yes. as, as you're looking at witnesses, are do you kind of go after them primarily because you're wondering, are they related or is it also about that fan principle where they may not be related, but researching them might actually lead me to more about my own ancestor because of their, whatever their relationship was. What do both of those play into the way you approach them? I would say both. I'm actually really excited when I see a witness or a bondsman um, because the curiosity serves you very well in genealogical research, as we know. Uh, you know, it's a good thing to be nosy when yeah. you're a genealogist. So I want to know why is that person there? I mean, that's that's the question that I'm trying to answer. And more than a few times, it has led me to more family that I didn't know about, particularly if that individual had a different surname. Now, another got you is that sometimes they end up in the records with their, just their initials, right? So we first got to confirm who that person is before we can, we're ready to say that they're related to our person of interest. So our, there are some sort of cautions that we need, need to be aware of as we're doing this research. But I, I'm just, I, it's another stone to overturn as you're doing your research. And I love it when I see a person listed in a record. I'm just, I'm excited. 
<laughs> Me too. I, I feel like, oh my gosh, I finally have another avenue that I can pursue, yes. uh, particularly in the yes. walls. So in the article, you kind of help people figure out exactly what the process would be. I mean, you have a, a three-step research process, which I think is great because sometimes you see that name and then you're not sure how to go about it. Walk us through just sure. briefly what that three-step process is. Okay, so the first thing that I do when I find a document concerning my ancestor that has a witness or bondsman, the first thing I do is transcribe the document. I want to make sure that we all kind of, you know, are comfortable with the practice of transcribing, but that's going to make sure that you are actually reading every single word in that document. It's going to help you notice all of the details that you might miss if you're just looking at it in this its current format. Um, there are a lot of great free tools available to use for um, transcribing. There's Genscriber, there's Transcript, and I would also recommend Family Trees cheat sheet on reading old handwriting. So that becomes very handy when you're doing this transcription. So the second step is to then do the research. I always say you want to research in a variety of records, and I actually research the person as if they were my ancestor already. So I'm looking in census records and deed records and court records and everything else trying to establish who this person is. And the things that we learn along the way are not just that that this person is in this time and place, which is very important to us as genealogists, but it also gives us a hint as to how old the person was. And it also gives us a hint about their literacy in terms of whether they sign with their mark or whether they sign with a signature. So it's in this second step that you probably uncover that the person is related to your family when you're doing this deep research. The third step is to actually research the laws because as we know, laws governed everything about the sources that we use in genealogy. And they're gonna govern who can serve as a witness and a bondsman, how old that person has to be, and also how many were, were necessary. So we, we need to be aware that these laws are going to differ from state to state or colony or a, a locale and also throughout time. So I look at the published state laws that I can find in databases like Internet Archive and Hottie Trust and Google Books. But you can also visit your local library, law library in your archives um, if you've really got to do some deep digging. So those are the three steps that I recommend. Transcribe the document, research the individuals you find, and make sure that you research the laws. Fantastic advice, really. I, Robin, I'd love to ask you a little bit more about the transcription, because I think that is a step that can be tempting to skip, right? People think, oh, well, I read it. I, I want to get going. I want to add people to my tree. Will you tell us a little bit more about that? I know, you know, you do a lot of research. What kind of advice do you have for people to, why, again, why they should take that time, but also you mentioned a couple of the tools. What are we looking for instead of just typing the words? What else are we looking for? So, Transcription to me is one of the basic genealogical skills I think we need to master in order to be successful, particularly once we start going back further in time and, and encountering those much more complicated problems. And it's one of those basics that will remind you, if you don't do it, over and over again, that there's a reason why it's recommended in genealogy. I can't tell you how many phrases I've realized as I'm transcribing that I don't fully understand. And step one is to understand what that document is telling you. And so if there's a phrase I come across, I might email an archivist. I might call one of my genealogy friends who's got a little bit more experience in that particular time and place. But transcribing helps us to do that. But now when I transcribe, I also typically turn it into an abstract right? And I'm also making sure that I do a citation. So to me, those are the building blocks of successful genealogical research. And when you start skipping those kinds of things, I would also include keeping a research log, having a research plan. Those to me are kind of very critical building blocks to long-term success in genealogy. So the transcription, I, I understand the impulse to want to 
to want to skip it. But I can tell you over and over again that I come across phrases that I thought I knew, but once I'm transcribing it, I really realize that I don't. So there are lots of wonderful webinars and classes that you can take on transcription. It's a very simple set of rules when you're transcribing, and they're easy to, to, to learn. They're not uh, complicated rules. And I think that once you start doing it, you'll get more comfortable with the process and it will really become second nature. So I hope that I can encourage everyone with our conversation to do more of that transcribing. I did a lot of it earlier, not necessarily knowing or understanding all the rules. And now I'm going back and sort of revisiting those documents. It's, it's always amazing when things will jump out at you, isn't it? <laughs> you didn't, you either didn't yeah. see it the first time yes. or it just didn't resonate. I mean... Yeah. Things you miss, things you never saw, things yeah. you, you know, I always recommend having a genealogy buddy. So things you go, hey, you, you know, can you take a look at this and tell me what you see? And so having new eyes look at it and ask you a question. But I, I find all of this, you know, I'm a genealogy junkie. So I find all of this really, really exciting to me. So I kind of lean into it. And I try not to do, you know, we've all got other things to do in our lives. And I just, you know, an hour here, it might be an hour this weekend, but I'm sort of just always working towards a goal. And uh, that transcription, boy, I tell you, that's a key first step. Well, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'd love to know, Have do you have a story? Do you have a witness story or just something uh, that you spotted that you just would love to share with us? I'd love to have you inspire our uh, viewers to, to no, really go for it. You know, I do. You okay. know, I do. Um, my mother's family is my maternal family is from Tennessee. And so when I was researching my second great grandfather, his name is Mike Fendricks in Tennessee, where he lived, almost every source in his life asserts that he was born in Alabama. And so this is a problem that a lot of genealogists have. I had no idea where in Alabama, even though I thoroughly went through all of the sources that were available in that time and place. So I noticed that he served as bondsman to a man named D. Suggs. And then I noticed that he took a couple of sharecropping, jointly took a couple of sharecropping um, deeds with the same man, D. Suggs, and that he was living in D. Suggs' house in 1920. So, you know, the wheels start turning. Why is he interacting with this man? And D. Suggs was also born in Alabama. So when the records ran out for my ancestor, I started researching D. Suggs. And where did D. Suggs lead me? D. Suggs led me back to Lawrence County, Alabama. And in that 1870 census household was a man named Mike. And that man ended up being his brother. It was his half brother. And the same man is my second great, great grandfather. They had migrated to Tennessee together. They had been formerly enslaved. And I found a Freedmen's Bureau contract that, that their mother signed where she calls all of them her children. So it wasn't just, you know, the 1870 census doesn't provide relationships. Right. So I had that critical labor contract that said Sophrona and her four children. And so, you know, it makes all the sense in the world why he's associating with him and living with him and jointly, you know, promising bond for him. It is because they were half brothers. I knew you'd have a great story. That Robin. Was <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh my God. I love, and, and that story is the crux of my cluster genealogy lecture that I do. I go into kind of more details, but following D is what led me to that community and his place of origin in Northern Alabama. And so it was very exciting. And so, you know, I took that excitement in my curiosity about other people into all the other places that I research. And I know you bring many stories to your readers at Reclaiming Kin. Tell us uh, the URL address and what they will find there at your website. Oh, thank you so much. So it's www.reclaimingkin.com 
www.ginnyallenbrown.com, one word, and I call it a genealogy teaching blog. And what I mean by that is I might start off with, with something from my family history, but every single post is meant to teach a skill. And so every post there talks about a methodology, a strategy, or a resource. So it's not just about my family history. It's about helping all genealogists to grow their skills and also meet the special challenges of researching the enslaved. So I'd be really happy if your listeners would come to the blog, take a look, sign up for my mailing list, and I'll send you a free PDF of all my favorite research tips. Oh, it was such a joy talking with J. Mark Lowe and with Robin Smith. I hope you found this helpful and you're going to find the show notes helpful. So head to genealogygems.com and under podcast in the menu, just go to episode number 277 and you'll find a link over to the show notes page for this episode. If you're a premium member, there are downloadable handouts for you as always. And if you are not a premium member, I hope you'll consider becoming one. There are a lot of perks. We do our monthly live 11s is with Lisa video show. Uh, we have downloadable handouts and cheat sheets for every podcast episode, every video, whether it's a free video or a premium video, premium members get all of that. It's all designed to help you climb your family tree and uh, just have a lot more fun doing it. Thank you so much for listening, my friend. I'll talk to you soon.